Hi, everybody. How are you? Thanks for coming out today. Can you hear me? Yeah. On the mic? Okay. So thanks, Marjan, for the introduction. So I'm just going to try to keep this basic so we can all relate and you guys can understand instead of talking about confusing medical terminology. So irritated red eyes. So causes of red eye, there's a lot of different causes of red eye. Um, we kind of broke it up into things that can cause vision threatening and decrease in your vision permanently versus things that are more benign and not necessarily causing anything bad to the eye. Um, so subconjunctival hemorrhage, you might have seen this or you might have had one when people cough really hard, if they're straining, they get blood in the white part of their eye. It goes away, it's just like a bruise on the skin. But that's something that once it goes away, just like a bruise on the skin, it has no effect on the vision, um, it's usually harmless. It just looks really bad, but it doesn't harm the eye. Um, something like a chalazion or a sty that you guys might have heard of, it's, it's like, almost like getting a pimple on the margin of your eyelid. Uh, blepharitis, which is another very common problem. And viral conjunctivitis or pink eye um, also causes a red eye. And dry eye, a lot of times when people get really dry eyes, the vessels get really inflamed, irritated, and then the, red, the eye can look red. Um, another common problem is just a scratch on the surface of the eye, or we call it an abrasion. That can make the eye really inflamed and irritated as well. Um, nasal lacrimal duct obstruction, that's basically this duct that we have right here by the nose. That's where all of your tears drain. Um, so if that part gets obstructed, it backs up and the eye can get really red and inflamed. Uh, let's go to the next side. So some things that are more concerning, that we are more concerned about and we want to follow you guys very closely for, something called cellulitis or an infection of the eye, skin around the eyelids. Sometimes this is called a preceptal cellulitis where it's more superficial, but sometimes the infection can spread into where the eyelid, eye sits and then we call it orbital cellulitis, which is very uh, concerning. Sometimes we admit people to the hospital for this condition as well. Um, and then there's this thing called orbital pseudotumor. It's also inflammation of where the eye, eye itself sits. Stevens-Johnson syndrome, it's a reaction from certain medications. Uh, bacterial conjunctivitis and infections from the surface of the eye. And also uveitis, um, inflammation inside the eye and glaucoma can cause a red eye also. So let's see. So I kind of briefly went over a lot of these topics, but we broke it up into anatomical parts of the eye. So on the lids is where you could see blepharitis, inflammation of the eyelid glands, the chalazion or sty. Basically, chalazion and sty are the same thing. We just call it different terminology when it blocks a specific eyelid gland. But chalazion is basically the same concept as of a sty. Um, molluscum is just an infection that some people get. Um, Orbit is in the, where the eye itself sits. I talked about preceptal cellulitis or infection of the eye, slid skin around the eye. And then the lacrimal system, I kind of briefly touched on that. It's where your tears drain into this duct. And then from here, it goes into your nose, into your throat. So if that part gets plugged up, it can cause um, irritation and redness in the eye. The conjunctiva, that's the white clear covering of the eyelid. Um, so that's where you get the conjunctivitis, viral causes or bacterial causes. That's where you can get the subconjunctival hemorrhage where the blood vessel bur bursts and the white part of your eye looks red. Um, pterygium, you guys might have seen this or I'm sure you you know people that have it. It's a little growth near the eyelid, near the colored part of the eye. And it usually happens after sun exposure when people are out in the sun or if they've spent many years gardening or farmers, they get that. It's a benign growth, it's nothing bad, but it often gets inflamed and it causes the eye to get red. So cornea is the front part of the eye, the clear covering. Um, that can get infected as well. People that wear contact lenses, that sleep with the lenses overnight. And the anterior chamber is the component of the eye, inside the eye, between the front of the eye and the back of the eye. There's a chamber um, and that can get inflamed as well. So this is just some brief anatomy of the eyelids in the orbit. There's basically the front part of the eyelid. I don't know if I have a pointer here. Um, 
But this part right here is the front, the skin, and then when we lift the eyelid up, this is how the back surface of the eyelid looks. There's basically a bunch of glands in the eyelid itself, and those glands produce tears for our eyes. So every time we blink, we're lubricating the front of our eye, and those glands are responsible for doing that. So in blepharitis, we get blockage of these glands, and you can see the bottom picture, these small little whole, um, little dot type structures. This is how it looks when they get plugged up. So instead of making the proper tears for our eyes, they get plugged up and then they produce this gunky material. People wake up in the morning complaining of itchiness or crusting of the eyelids, and then the eye can get red also. Um, chalazion or hordeolum, I said similar to, if you know the word sty, um, it's almost similar to, it goes along with the blepharitis, but when the gland gets so plugged up um, and kind of angry, it forms this bump. And then that's when we see this bump around the eyelid. So usually it's something benign. Again, it's nothing really concerning. We tell people to treat it by doing a washcloth, taking hot water, and putting heat to that area. Because just like a pimple, heat to that area will help open up the pore and release all those secretions. Sometimes, however, it doesn't resolve months and months, and we have to actually make a little cut and drain out the stuff in, from that gland. Uh, canaliculitis is part of the drainage system um, by the nose, and if that gets infected, there's many causes like viruses, bacteria, um, but it gets infected and then you, people can get this gunky discharge and we treat it with antibiotics. Dacryocystitis is also going along part of the blockage of the nasal lacrimal duct system where the tears drain. That whole um, duct, basically it goes from here down to here, gets plugged up and then it, it becomes red and inflamed. And also we, we might have to kind of make a little incision if there's an abscess and drain it out. Uh, these dacryoadenitis usually seen more in kids. So there's a gland up here, another gland um, by the eyebrow on this side of the eye, and it helps with the tear process with making the tears. Um, so this can get inflamed and infected as well, and that can cause a red eye. Um, talking about conjunctiva, I know I told you guys there's the white part of the eye, which is the conjunctiva, but there's two parts of the conjunctiva. The white part is called the, palpe the bulbar conjunctiva. And when you lower your eyelid and that, the red area there, that's called the palpebral conjunctiva. So it's just kind of terms that we use, two different types. So with conjunctivitis, which I'm sure you've all seen someone or been familiar with, it's usually caused by viral stuff. Like the same way you get a viral cold or a flu, the virus can affect the eye as well. So you can get red eye, uh, mucus, yellowy discharge, um, usually because it's a virus, it goes away on its own. Sometimes we give some antibiotic or something to prevent it from becoming infected. Um, but there's different kinds of conjunctivitis and we, we base it on what we see in the eye. So in the eye, we can see these little follicle type structures when we look inside the eye. Those are more specific caused by certain things such as viruses, bacteria, um, toxins, um, chlamydia can do it. So when we see these findings, we think more about these, this type of etiology. Papillary conjunctivitis, the eyelid, the part of the eyelid more looks like more reddish and there's different <clears throat> nodules that we see. This also has different causes, can be allergic, it can be caused by a different type of bacteria and also by medications. And then the viral one that I was talking about. Um, usually people have lymph nodes that become tender. They usually have the symptoms starting in one eye and then it spreads to another eye. Um, like I said, it's usually we tell people just avoid touching the eye. It usually goes away on its own, but it's very contagious. So that's why we tell kids to stay away from school or if you go to work to maybe um, take a few days off from work because it is contagious. Um, and then this is just some different types of the virus. Uh, follicular conjuncti conjunctivitis, like I mentioned before, can be due to many different things. Medications can actually cause it. Sometimes we prescribe eye drops and that can cause a reaction of the conjunctiva, causing these follicles, um, viruses. Herpes virus can cause a conjunctivitis as well. The same kind of herpes virus um, you might have seen when people get cold sores or things that can come into the eye as well. 
molluscum is usually more seen in um, the pediatric or young population, but there are these small little nodules that we notice, and this can cause a similar type of conjunctivitis. And then bacterial conjunctivitis. This is probably one of the more severe types caused by bacteria. You get a lot of discharge from the eye. Um, we have to treat it with um, antibiotics. Sometimes we even admit people in the hospital for IV treatment. Um, and it's more of a severe concerning condition. But like I said, viral is much more common and we don't see bacterial as much, but when we do, it's much more concerning. Uh, allergic conjunctivitis, we really we often see in kids, even a lot of times in adults, just seasonal allergies. If you have a history of allergies where you take Claritin or Zyrtex, sometimes you can get the allergies affecting the eye. And people come with itching, watering eyes, tearing. So we have specific antihistamine drops that help with the allergic symptoms with the eyes. And we could even use other things like steroids that help. So this is the subconjunctival hemorrhage I think I had mentioned. It's basically a blood vessel in the white part of the eye breaks and it bleeds. So it looks really bad, but actually this is not harmful to the eye and the eye itself is okay. Um, it's usually caused from people that have high blood pressure or if they're straining really hard, coughing, if they're on blood thinners um, like Coumadin or aspirin, the vessels are just more fragile and then they break. And so it looks bad, but it resolves slowly over time, just like a bruise on the skin. <clears throat> um, a pterygium, like I mentioned before, is usually due to sun exposure. So we usually see it specifically in this location of the eye. It's usually right by the nose or sometimes even on the other side. And it's from exposure. The sun causes this excess tissue to grow there. Um, so it can cause irritation and then we treat it with eye drops, either artificial tears or sometimes we have to use something more, um, something more strong like a steroid drop. So keratitis or ulcer is an, is an infection of the cornea and the cornea is basically this clear part covering the colored part of the eye. So around the colored part of the eye, and that's the cornea. And that can get infected a lot of times with, by bacteria, by funguses, viruses. We often see this in people that wear contact lenses that don't have good hygiene. That's why we stress the importance of don't, sleeping, don't sleep with your contact lenses overnight, um, just because it kind of um, prevents the eye from getting oxygen and, and then it's more prone to getting infections. So again, uh, these are some questions we always use. Do, the, do you wear contact lens? Do you swim with your lenses in the water? Because all that stuff is risk factors for developing an infection. Um, treatment, we do a little scraping in the clinic and we send it off to the lab to figure out what kind of organism it is. Because we can treat it with antibiotics, but we don't really know what kind of specific organism it is. Um, usually the antibiotics we, we use are very broad, so it covers most things. Um, but that's what we do is we take a little scraping of it and send it off to the lab. Um, so fungal, fungal things can cause infection of the cornea as well. These are usually more difficult to treat. It's usually seen in people that have dealt with branch, tree branches or vegetable matter. Um, contact lens wearers can still get it. People that have had like history of LASIK or refractive surgery. So it's just another cause. Um, acanth amoeba is another type of organism that can infect the cornea. And again, these are very, very severe infections and these are considered life threat, um, vision threatening infections that are more concerning. So one other thing, iritis. Iritis is a very broad general term we describe when there's any inflammation inside the eye. So the vessels might be inflamed and the eye might look red, but when we look inside the eye, we can see little cells floating around. Those little cells kind of signify that there's inflammation in the eye itself. And when that happens, we call it iritis. Um, so that can happen due to a lot of different reasons. Sometimes it's associated with other systemic medical problems, such as um, you can get autoimmune conditions like lupus, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, a lot of things can cause inflammation in the eye as well. So that's why it's important for us to know what other medical problems you might have because it could be the same thing causing inflammation in the eye. Um, and then we have some drops and things that we treat this with as well. A little too detailed to go into, but, but those are just some broad kind of um, 
causes of red eye. I'm going to pass it on to Marjan now, who's going to talk about dry eye disease specifically. Are there any questions right now regarding any of the, uh, we sort of did a fast review of a lot of detailed uh, issues, but if there's any questions, now's a good time. Bacterial is more concerning because they can actually get it from birth, so from pregnancy, from the delivery. If the mother has some sort of infection like herpes, syphilis, chlamydia, when they actually are delivered, the baby, the virus or the bacteria gets transmitted. So that's how the babies can get it. Um, in adults, often kind of similar, the same way they get it from sexually transmitted diseases. Um, it can affect the eye, the gonor gonorrhea, chlamydia, all that stuff. But the children in the school age, those... Yeah, your school your school age children are more likely to get it from viruses. Um, very common, there's a virus that comes out sort of late late summer, early fall that a lot of kids get. So pink eye, it's usually not bacterial, uh, and they don't really require antibiotics, but it's extremely contagious. Yeah, they need to be taken out. A viral conjunctivitis is more contagious than bacterial conjunctivitis, and often it gets confused. But bacterial conjunctivitis is rather rare and more seen in the diseases that Dr. Rao was mentioning. Okay, why don't we switch gears to dry eye disease? Because this is sort of an epidemic uh, in Southern California. And uh, uh, a, a recent study approximated nearly 30 million patients or adults uh, who are not necessarily patients report sign, uh, symptoms of dry eye disease, but not all of them get into, uh, find treatment or get into an eye care practitioner's office. Um, dry eye disease is usually chronic, so it starts sometimes as an irritation and we sort of ignore it or we may just put some artificial tears on it, but over time it can get worse and worse if it's not dealt with adequately. It, oftentimes in the more severe stages it becomes inflammatory, so the tears are actually um, inflamed. And so there's anti-inflammatories that we might need to put patients on for that. And we diagnose based on symptoms, what the patient tells us, but also signs, what we see in the exam. And those two don't correlate. Sometimes I see patients who have severe dry corneas, but they're not complaining of any discomfort or pain or any symptoms. And sometimes that's because the nerves of their cornea have dulled out a little bit, so they're not feeling. And conversely, sometimes we see patients who complain very severely of discomfort, burning, itching, yeah, all, all the symptoms of dry eye disease, but they don't necessarily show a lot of the signs on exam. Both are important and both need to be treated, so from different angles. Lots of, you know, all my dry eye patients say, well, what causes dry eye disease? It's so multifactorial. There are so many things that affect dry eye disease in general. These are some of them. We think increased screen time has a big, uh, a, a big role in worsening and, and seeing more dry eye disease. Um, our blink rate goes about from about 12 to 16 blinks per minute to about four when we're sitting on a screen, whether we're watching TV or we're at a computer. A lot of systemic medications, antihypertensive medications, these things make dry eyes worse. Um, lifestyle, alcohol, uh, smoking, those things make dry eye disease worse, among other things. Arid conditions, so dry uh, environments. Southern California can be pretty dry. Um, that will definitely worsen things. Windy environments. I have patients who sit under a ceiling fan for, you know, 10 hours a day during their work, that is a huge risk factor for dry eye disease, especially if they're at the computer and they've got the ceiling fan going. And then pollutants uh, make a big effect. Hormonal impacts are, are huge as in women as well as men. Um, testosterone to some, um, some uh, degree is uh, protective against dry eye disease, but we all of our testosterone level, women and men decrease over time, and so age is also a risk factor. So we talked about some of these other things, history of contact lens wear, history of any surgery in the eye can make dry eye disease a little bit worse. Um, sometimes if, if your physician sort of knows about that and can start treating the dry eye disease even before the surgery, then we can optimize how patients do after surgery as well. Lots of autoimmune diseases worse than dry eye disease, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's disease, lupus, uh, thyroid disease makes dry eye disease also worse. And um, so we talked about some of those. We have lots of new technology now to help us 
identify severity of dry eye disease. Lots of tests that we can do in the office in addition to the traditional tests where we would stain the surface of the eye and look for dry spots. We can now test inflammation on the tear film. We can test the osmolarity of the tears to see how uh, hyper osmolar they are, which is a direct correlation with uh, dry, dryness. Um, and uh, we can actually image the glands. I'll, I'll go through some of these in a little bit more detail. But when do we start treat, uh, initiating testing is when we obviously hear complaints. Some, again, some patients will complain of the burning, stinging, ocular fatigue, but some patients don't. Some patients come in and say, well, my cataract is getting worse, but sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. That's not, vi that's not cataract. Fluctuation of vision is almost 100% of the time due to uh, tear film irregularity. So if the vision is fluctuating, sometimes good, sometimes bad, that's dry eye disease. So even in the absence of the pain and discomfort. Let me uh, move on in the interest of time. I mentioned osmolarity of the tears. We have something to test that. I mentioned inflammation of the tear film. We actually have, some of you may have had this uh, done if you've uh, kind of been evaluated for dry eye disease where we can look for uh, cytokines or inflammation markers in the tear film. We have imaging of the glands of the lid. Dr. Rao mentioned that the glands in the eyelids, specifically the oil glands, have a very important role because they produce the oils that help keep our tears on our ocular surface. The tears have multiple layers and the most su surface layer is an oil layer that's produced in these glands in the lids. If the oil layer is poor, then the tears evaporate faster. And evaporative dry eye is one of the most common types of dry eye. So we can actually image the glands. You see that's a healthy eyelid, nice skinny glands throughout. Uh, down below we'll see a lid where the glands are starting to shorten, they're starting to thicken because the, the oils are getting turning into fats and thickening up and, and not releasing properly. And over time, y there's actually atrophy where the glands will fall out, but not fall out, but atrophy away. So they're, they're not producing oils. This is not just in older patients. I've, I've uh, imaged my glands and I have 50% of my glands missing. So really it's, it's not just a disease that we're seeing in older patients, but it can start early. And now we have a way of actually looking at this. And we have ways of addressing and starting to treat this particular problem as well. So treatment strategies. There is a lot of treatments for dry eye disease. There's never one treatment fits all. And uh, really our modality of where we start in these broad categories are, well, what type of dry eye disease is there? Is it mostly an oil gland issue? Is it a tear production tissue? Is it both? What are some of the underlying risk factors? Maybe we need to address those. Uh, and so based on uh, all of that and severity, we'll decide where to start for each patient. Okay, so let's go through some of the basics. You've probably heard your doctor say, well, start some artificial tears. Artificial tears are a great starting point, and they're a little bit uh, of a palliative medication. It's not, uh, they're not really a treatment. They're a way to lubricate the eyes and very mild dry eye disease. I usually uh, tell my patients to use preservative free drops. I prefer the artificial tears not to have preservatives in them because sometimes the preservatives can irritate the eyes more. Um, there's gels and ointments that some patients can use at night, especially if the lids don't close well when you're sleeping. Uh, and I always ask patients, have someone look at you when you're sleeping, are your lids closing? Because some patients wake up with severe dry eye pain and it's because their lids don't close all the way. So with those patients, we'll put them on gels or ointments at night to help lubricate overnight. There's a couple of prescription drops now that have been approved and on the market for the treatment of dry eye disease. One of those is Restasis. You may have heard about this. It's been on the market for like 14 years now. Very good treatment. It's cyclosporin. It's an anti-inflammatory that is not a steroid. It's very safe to use. Multiple studies have been done on it over the years and I'm not going to go through a lot of the details, but it works. It works a little bit slowly. Um, so it takes about six to eight weeks for it to kick in and then it can build effect. Some patients get stinging though and they don't tolerate it well. So um, 
variable tolerability in some patients. I have patients who love it and who have been on it for years. Some patients we've tried it on and they didn't really like it and couldn't stay on it. So this just went generic, I think, recently. So um, access is a little bit better now for some insurance uh, carriers, and I'm not sure which ones cover it and which ones don't. There's also other formulations of cyclosporin that we can use as well, which, which also work similar. Steroids. Steroids are great for anti-inflammation, and they make the eyes feel good overall, but steroids are not a good long-term solution because steroids can have side effects. They can increase the pressure of the eye. They can worsen the cataract development a little bit. There are some really nice mild steroids, however, and for patients who I trust and who have these fluctuations in their dry eyes during the exacerbations when their symptoms are really severe, I'll allow the use of steroid drops for a week or two. And that's a safe length of time to use the steroids as needed. So we do um, have those in our armamentarium. Lefitograst or Zydra was recently approved about a year and a half ago or so. Um, sometimes access can be difficult, but it's getting better. It's getting onto more insurance carriers. This is a great drop as well. It's an anti-inflammatory that is not a steroid, similar to Restasis, very well tolerated and uh, very safe. So you can take it for years with no issues, taken twice a day, morning and night, and it sort of hits the inflammatory cascade of the tear film at multi multiple areas. Works faster than Restasis as early as two weeks. Again, I have patients who absolutely love it and I have some patients where they don't like the feel of it or uh, it most often, you know, coverage becomes an issue. So as it becomes more covered, we're trying to get more and more patients to um, get on this drop and if they tolerate it to stay on it because we think long term it helps with the inflammation of, of the uh, tear film. This is what it looks like. It comes in these 60 of these vials. Um, you're supposed to throw the vial away after you use it. There's about four drops per vial. So patients say, can I stretch it out? Sure. Um, but you can't get more than two doses out of it anyways because they don't give you that much extra. All right, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Neural stimulation, this is kind of interesting new area of dry eye treatment. Um, and um, it's built around uh, triggering the nerves that produce a tear. So uh, there are nerves essentially on the surface of the eye and in the nose, the nasociliary nerve, that feed back to our brain to produce tears. And so this is the true tear that was approved <coughs> probably uh, less than a year ago, but just about maybe a year ago, is now available. And what it is, it's a little stimulator. Those two prongs are placed inside the nasal cavity. Sounds kind of crazy, but it works and you, you give a little stimulation to the nerves up here and it causes a tear to be produced. Mm -hmm. And initially we said, well, this is kind of crazy. Those are reflex tears. They're not gonna have the three true components, which are the mucus, the water, and the oil, but they do. So they've done research and they've shown that the tear that's produced is actually a true tear. It has all the important uh, components. And you can use it about 10 times, they have little, uh, uh, disposable tips and the tip lasts 24 hours so you can use it 10, 10 times a day if you need to but most patients that have used it initially will use it more but over time as their dry eye disease improves they're using it less throughout the course of the day. It's expensive though it's not covered by insurance so the little uh, device is something like $900 and the tips a tips, the, a, a month pack, which there's 30 in it, are somewhere around $50. It depends where you get it, and who, but you can go directly to the company and get it, or they have some stored here. Lots of doctor's offices will have some of these that they'll sell from their office. But that's, it's a costly treatment, but for some patients, they're excited about it because it's of a, more of a natural. So I thought it's interesting to talk about this because it's, it's new. Serum drops. Right, how many of you are on serum drops? Anybody in the audience? Okay, I love serum drops. Serum drops I call the golden elixir. Serum drops are made out of your own blood. Essentially patients um, who have moderate to severe dry eye disease uh, and who may have tried some of the other um, things that we talked about and didn't work well, we'll send them to the lab, uh, we'll draw their blood, 
uh, that blood gets sent to a compounding pharmacy that spins down the red blood cells, gets rid of the red blood cells, takes the serum portion of the blood, bottles it. And the product you get back are a bunch of little vials filled with serum. You freeze the batch. The batch is good in the freezer for about six months. You take one vial at a time. It needs to be refrigerated. You use it all week. You throw it away and get the new one out. So one batch lasts about four to six months, depending on how, uh, how often patients are using it. But it's lovely. It works very well, both to help with symptoms as well as to help with signs. So it clears up a lot of the micro erosions we see on the cornea from chronic dry eye disease. It's a little bit of a hassle. You have to go to the lab a couple of times a year. Um, now, sometimes I'll put a patient on it for about six months for one batch. And if they're doing much better, then we'll switch back to something like artificial tears. So just because you use it once, it doesn't mean you're committed for lifelong. This is also not covered by the insurance. Um, the lab that compounds these for us charged $350 for that one batch, which can last somewhere between four and six months. So it's not terrible, but it is you know, an out-of-pocket cost. So we take all of that into account when, when we're talking to patients to see who's appropriate for this. Okay, amniotic membrane. So this is also new to the world of ocular surface di disease and dry eye disease. Not terribly new. We've had this around for about a decade now. The amniotic membrane is what surrounds the baby. We don't take it from embryos or from anything like that. These are from babies who've already been born and the mothers have donated the placenta. So that tissue gets freeze processed and um, prepared in different forms for the ocular surface. One form is something called the prochera. The prochera is like a contact lens and has a, it's a, has a layer of amniotic membrane on it. So we put the contact lens on the eye. It lasts maybe five to seven days, something like that. It actually dissolves. But during that time, it, it creates sort of this microenvironment of healing. They've found that the amniotic membrane has anti-inflammatory and some healing properties. Uh, and regenerative properties that other materials don't. And so it gives that sort of microenvironment of regeneration to the ocular surface. And it actually lasts. So I have had patients who come in severe ocular surface uh, keratitis or uh, uh, punctate erosions, if you will, and we'll put this in for a week and it'll heal. So it can, it can be remarkable. But during that week, the vision is horrible because it's sort of an opaque film. So we can't put it in both eyes, right? And, and you don't want to plan a vacation during that time or anything like that. So uh, that's available. There are other forms, the dry form that can be put placed under a regular contact lens. The dry form is not as effective. I'm not a big fan, but that's also around. There's also uh, amniotic membrane extract. So um, there's a couple of companies that have taken amniotic membrane and actually taken extract, uh, extracted it down. I don't know how they do it, but essentially put it into an eye drop. And it works similar to serum drops. Um, it sort of, again, uh, supplies the ocular surface with some of that regenerative ability, cytokines, proteins, and growth factors. Twice a day, also not covered by the insurance, and it's a little bit more expensive. I think the company, Genesis, charges something like $250 for their one-month supply, which can actually be stretched out to about a two- or three-month supply. I'm a big fan of stretching it out. So. All right, let's switch to lid margin disease treatment. So mybobian gland disease, Dr. Rao mentioned as well, that's when the oil glands get thickened and the, and the oils turn into fats and they don't flow. You can see that's, uh, we see this when we're doing our exam. Patients sometimes don't realize they have severe gland disease. So um, we'll treat these. And here are some of those images that I showed earlier. That's very severe atrophy of the gland on that uh, left side there. Uh, we'll treat with warm compresses. I put almost every patient of mine on warm compresses. We have lid scrubs to help clean some of the bacteria and debris that form and can clog those oil glands. Um, and we have a treatment in the office called Lipiflow. This is me getting my Lipiflow treatment where we hook up uh, the lids. This is 100% safe. And there's a 12-minute heat and massage sequence to help evacuate those trapped glands. 
So I tell patients it's like going to the dentist once a year and getting a deep clean. You still want to do your warm compresses every night. That's like brushing your teeth. But consider doing this once a year or once every other year even to really keep those oil glands flowing and, and not covered by the insurance. Horrible. $750 per eye and we're on the lower end. So these things are all sort of out-of-pocket costs, but for some patients who have severe gland disease, this is a, a, an option and it works very well. And that's sort of the business end of it. The, the cornea is protected the entire time with that. IPL is another treatment that is not FDA approved. I'm not gonna talk too much about it. It's uh, basically a light that helps clog up the uh, uh, blood vessels that are going and creating inflammation at the lid margin. Works for some patients. And sort of a severe, uh, more severe form treatment is actually probing those uh, glands and trying to open them mechanically. Very painful. There are some other oral anti-inflammatories like doxycycline, which is an oral antibiotic sometimes we put patients on who have severe oil disease. And finally, for severe, severe ocular surface and dry eyes, sometimes we'll use one of these large therapeutic contact lenses. This is for very, very severe ocular surface burns and patients who really can't even tolerate their eyes despite you know, everything else. And it sort of, again, creates a little microenvironment of fluid between the contact lens and the ocular surface. Okay, is everyone getting tired? <laughs> I didn't realize I have so many slides. Uh, let me, conjunctival cholesis, I'll, 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 cause I wanna get, leave time for questions. This is when there's a lot of extra tissue, conjunctival on the ocular surface, sometimes it pooches out. Some patients say, I've got this sort of mucous membrane there all the time, and that's extra tissue. Sometimes we just trim that in the operating room and the symptoms get better. So this can cause a lot of burning and it's just from a little bit of extra tissue. It's like a tummy tuck for the eye. Uh, <laughs> no, that, but it gets covered by the insurance. That one gets covered by the insurance if that's what's going on because that's a surgical procedure. Uh, there's omega-3 fatty acids, um, fish oils, um, having a diet full of um, sort of healthy oils helps with the uh, oil glands. Sometimes humidifiers in the workplace, moisture goggles. There's an Orange County dry eye support group that also is a, has a wealth of information on different products and, and so on for patients who are suffering. All right, and of course, uh, hormones I mentioned. I talk to all patients. Sometimes I send men to uh, check testosterone levels because if the testosterone levels drop, sometimes men can have severe dry eye disease. Women will see it much earlier. And uh, the drive home thing here is there's no quick fix. It takes years to develop dry eye disease and it's sort of a slow uh, process getting ba patients back to a point where they have more good days than bad days. It's not a full magic, there's no magic bullet treatment that works for everybody. Usually I work with patients and try to find the right cocktail of things that need to be done from the lid, from the anti-inflammation, all of these things to try to optimize the ocular surface. So there's my little spiel on dry eye disease. So I'll open it up to questions now. So those are um, the ducts that drain the tears into the nose. Sometimes we'll put plugs. I didn't mention plugs. Oh, if the plugs, have if the plugs haven't there, worked. Yeah. So plugs are one of the treatments for dry eyes that I save for later, because we used to think dry eye disease is a volume issue. The volume of tears is low. And we found that that's not the case. It's the tear composition that's the problem. But sometimes as if, if I've corrected the tear composition and now I just am looking for more volume, I'll plug the I'll plug the gland, uh, the ducts. If the plugs fall out, if they don't stay in, sometimes we'll go in and cauterize them or suture them closed. So it sort of de it depends on uh, where we are on our algorithm of, of treatments. Um, so we usually switch to preservative free in cases where patients are using artificial tears more than three or four times a day. But, so if it's the little vials that are preservative free, I tell patients keep it and use it a few times, otherwise you're sort of wasting the money.
No, it's actually the right concept, but a lot of people do it wrong because sometimes they'll just heat up the washcloth or it's not hot enough. And if you just put it on there, that's okay. But I often tell, oftentimes tell my patients, make it pretty on the hotter side, not to burn yourself, but pretty warm and put it on the eye for a few minutes. Then after that, actually massage the upper parts of the eyelids and the lower parts. Um, it's hard to keep the compress hot though. That's the problem. So a lot of people don't like doing it. They come and came out with these eye heating masks that they're in the shit. You might guys might know they have little beads in it and you just stick it in the microwave and then you could put it on top of your eye. Um, it helps. I don't think it's as effective as actually doing the warm compress if you have a lot of blockage, but it's still an option and it's easier. A lot of people do that. <laughs> um, yes, I am from the Middle East too, and my mom just says, "Do a tea bag." Yeah, yeah. yeah there, we don't need the tea. No, just do. You just need the heat. <laughs> it hasn't been scientifically proven yeah. yet, but a lot of things in science we don't know. Mm -hmm. Is there some benefit in tea? I don't know. But at this point, I'm not recommending it because it's not evidence based. Um, however, yeah, mainly the heat. There's actually Trader Joe's has a face wash yeah. for tr with that has a little bit of tea tree oil in it. Oh, okay. uh, it, it tea tree oil, be careful because it can sting if it gets into the eyes. But sometimes it's really good for cleaning up some of the micro um, mites and things that are floating around in our environment because mites can infest the eyelids too. So it helps c clean those off. There is a mask, and we actually have it downstairs. I have no financial interest in it, but it's called the Bruder mask. And what it does is it has some micro-patented um, material in there where it actually takes air, but it actually um, turns it into wet heat. So you can get that, put it in the microwave for 20 seconds, and you put that on the eyes, and it's perfect. And you don't need to do this running under the hot water and so on. Imaging modalities we use in the office do not, they're not causing dry eyes. I, I see patients sometimes sitting in the office with the numbing drops in for a long time and not blinking and they get a little bit dry, but that's very temporary. The, the imaging itself does not create dry eyes. No. No, it's very, very safe. Oh, we just turned the lid over a little bit, the lower lid. We can image the upper one too, but it's a little bit more, it's difficult to flip the upper lid. And usually the upper lid follows what the lower lid is doing anyway. So the lower lid gives us a, a view into the world of the glands. Uh, we just we use a Q-tip, roll, roll down that lower lid and get an image like this. Very easy, very so safe. It takes only a... Like no, 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 nothing like that. We do it in the clinic. It's 100% safe, and it just takes a minute or two. Yeah. We don't know if we can structurally bring back what's been lost. We've only had this imaging device for a couple of years. Um, what we use, so I'll do this initially on a patient and see where they are. And we'll also assess the physiology of the oils that are coming out by just pressing on the glands and seeing what quality of oils are coming out. After treatment, I just follow by m measuring the quality of the oils and how rapidly they're flowing. This doesn't seem to change early on. We don't know if we can bring dead glands back to life. We don't know. Yeah, so we have all of those measurements. We can test for inflammation. We can test to see how hyperosmolar or salty they are. We can uh, test the glands. And then there's a bunch of other tests that we've done traditionally that we still do as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Dry eye evaluation, which Dr. Rao does a ton of. I only do some as well.
Well, it just depends. I think like uh, Dr. Fareed mentioned, California is so dry. Um, that's the problem, it's a dry heat. But a lot of people or patients that I've seen, if they go somewhere else that has humidity, their dry eyes actually feel much better. So you'll notice that. So it depends on where you go because weather and environment has a lot to do with the dry eyes too. Um, moisture versus dry, evaporating off the tears more quickly. Um, so it just depends, but always people, dry eye patients, they know and they'll always take their artificial tears with them or their regimen with them. Because this problem is usually a chronic problem. Um, it will never really go away forever. Um, unfortunately, you'll have good days, bad days. So it comes and goes. Um, but we try to get you to a point where you're, it's manageable and you're not as miserable. That's a, that's a good point. Sometimes our blink rate is low. Um, we actually have a way of measuring blink rate as well, but sometimes patients don't blink as often. And they're, <laughs> you know, I actually have a little sheet that is a blink exercise. It reminds you to blink and do complete blinks. So absolutely, especially if you're working on a screen all day, taking a break and closing your eyes for a few minutes helps as well. Yeah. Absolutely. And these days, everyone's on their iPads, iPhones, devices, so we're, it's just getting worse. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.